Good afternoon. Uh, this is, uh, I'm Bob Hauser. I'm the executive officer of the American Philosophical Society. And if you look over my shoulder, you'll see a picture of uh, our founder, uh, Benjamin Franklin, at the end of the hall there. Um, I'm uh, very happy and uh, pleased uh, to, to be introducing this, the last session of our um, um, uh, spring 2022 meetings of the American Philosophical Society. Because Amartya Sen has been a bit, a bit late uh, logging on, we're going to reverse the order of the first two presentations. Uh, so we will hear the conversation between uh, Professor Sen and Mark Thompson uh, second in this afternoon's presentations. Um, and uh, I guess I will note that I, I certainly hope that this will be the last virtual session at an APS meeting uh, for years and years to come. Uh, but in any event, it should be a great session. And I will start by introducing uh, Marcus uh, Brunermeyer. Professor Brunermeyer is the Edwards S. Sanford Professor of Economics at Princeton and director of Princeton's Bentheim Center for Finance. He earned his PhD in economics from the London School of Economics. His research focuses on international financial markets and the macro economy with a special emphasis on bubbles, liquidity, financial and monetary price stability, and digital money. His recent book, The, the Resilient Society, won the prize for 21 for the best business book in German and was listed among best economic books by the Financial Times. Dr. Brunner Meyer is a Sloan Research Fellow, Fellow of the Econometric Society, Guggenheim Fellow, and the recipient of the Brunacer Prize granted for outstanding contributions in the fields of macroeconomics and finance. And now he has uh, 20 minutes uh, to tell us about digital currency, after which we will have a, a brief question and answer session. So feel free to enter your questions in the, in the Q&A box, uh, probably uh, linked at the bottom of your screen, uh, anytime you, you, would, you would care to. Thanks. Dr. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here with you virtually. And it's an honor to present to the American Philosophical Society. I will talk about the digital money and new developments, what's going on in digital money. And the first question you might ask, you know, isn't money digital already? Is, you know, or do we have a checking account, debit cards, credit cards? Then we have PayPal, Venmo, and Sally, we to split the bills and so forth. And isn't this already digital money we have already? And the only form of non-digital money is essentially physical cash. That's a physical form of money you're using. But what's the difference between the new forms of money and uh, the money we have already in digital format is that most of these monies we have already are private money. They're issued by a private entity, a private bank, like the checking account or credit card or credit card is actually coming from a, a private entity. Only the cash, the cash is given issued by the central bank, it's issued by the government. And of course, we also have reserves issued by the government and the reserves issued by the government or the central bank is also in digital form. So most of the money we have already is already in digital form. So what's all the big fuss about, uh, about digital money and so forth. Now, the first thing I would like to outline, how does the current system work? The current system, we have an interaction between the public and the private sector. We have a PPP, public-private partnership, essentially. It's a two-tier system. We have the government, the central bank, determining the unit of account. And then we have private banks. And the private banks then we interact as citizens with primarily. The only way we interact with the central bank is through cash. And then there's a big debate going on, you know, should we have more private money, less private money. And there is actually two polar cases, two extreme cases. And they really showed up uh, some years back when there was a referendum in Switzerland where people said, we actually want to have much more government involvement in the money creation. Private banks should not be allowed to create money. 
and that's the sovereign money school or in German the sovereign uh, money. Uh, that's essentially saying, you know, it should be not only the central bank should be allowed to create money, not the private banks. That's on the one extreme. On the other extreme, on the other polar case, you have the libertarian movement where the, all the crypto uh, currencies come in. They're all issued privately and they don't want any government in, involvement at all. And in a lot of competition among these currencies, let's say Hayek and competition among these um, uh, uh, free private monies in a sense. And these are the two polar cases. And the question is, you know, where do you want to land uh, in these two polar cases? So that's essentially what we have at the moment. We have this two tier system. It's a public private partnership. And then we have some thinking of what are the two extreme cases. But before I go further, I would outline four technological trends which we are seeing. So the first technological trend is that we essentially cash is being marginalized. We live more and more in a virtual world and cash is becoming less and less important. So the link between the central bank or the government to its citizens is actually breaking. And mostly we use virtual money. So if you have only digital money and it is only provided by the private sector, we break this link. And that's the so-called CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. So many central banks think of introducing uh, central bank digital currency. So that's, a, that's the first trend. The second trend is big tech. We have big data, artificial intelligence, deep learning. So it was the case that private banks always did deposit taking so you can park your money there. And uh, you, the private banks also lend out. You can get the mortgage and they lend out to firms and so forth. So there was a synergies between deposit taking and lending. And payments was always a secondary thing. But payments becomes much more central these days because with payments, you generate a lot of data, big data, and then suddenly with artificial intelligence and deep learning, you can extract a lot of information from this data. And that's radical and different change. This data is out there, but we never were able to really extract enough information from that because we didn't have the technologies. So that's the second trend. So we're going to big tech, essentially, and big tech players coming into the marketplace which really extract a lot of this data. The third trend is that we have this distributed ledger technologies. That's essentially blockchain technology where there's no one central entity which is determining when a transaction happened or didn't happen, but it's distributed among many potential um, uh, writers on the blockchain, also called miners on the blockchain. They determine whether a payment happened or did not happen. And we had all these new cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, there are thousands of cryptocurrencies now. And most recently the trend is to have stable coins. So they're stable to the dollar. So they're attached to the dollar, they're pegged to the dollar. That's one important element as well. And then you have the whole DeFi movement where you can have smart contracts. What's a smart contract? It says payments are done automatically. So when the sun is shining, payments is done. When it's raining, it's not done. So that's the third trend. First trend, cash is going away. Second trend, the big data and the exploitation of the big data. The third trend is having all this blockchain technology. And the fourth trend is industry 4.0. What, what does this mean? Right now we have supply chains, global value chains and supply chains. And there will be much more organized with blockchains. So whenever there's a widget from one company, one factory going to another factory, there are sensors on these widgets. And then you realize, oh, this widget moved from this factory to that factory will be recorded on a blockchain. And then it will be immediately paid on the payment rail. So all of this blockchain, so the automotive industry will have a blockchain with all the suppliers. The textile industry will have a blockchain with all their suppliers. And the IT sector will have a separate blockchain. And the payment will happen on this blockchain. So it will be recorded on these blockchains. And we will actually have a lot of micro payments, a lot of small payments. Whenever a little delivery comes, there will be immediately payment executed automatically. And so there will be explosion of programmable payments. So payments become much more programmable. So these are the four developments which actually will change the nature of money as we know it. Now, why is money itself affected? So why is it not just payments? So the question is, why is the underlying source of money affected? And the reason is actually many folds. So one is that we will have many more different forms of money. 
So as I said, there are all the supply chains. So each supply chain or the automotive industry will have a token. They will have a form of money. Textile industry will have a different form of token. There would be money which is programmable. So it can expire. You can give some stimulus and it expires at a certain point. And you have special purpose money. And there will be a segmentation, a fragmentation of all the different forms of money. And this, the big achievement of the, the 19th century and early 20th century was that we had a uniformity of money. So there's essentially there's one dollar, there's one euro. It's very easily comparable and all this. It's not like in the free banking era in the 19th century in the United States where different banks were issuing different banknotes and then you had to swap one banknote for another banknote. So the uniformity of money will probably go away. So the question is, will the uniformity of money stay or will there be different tokens floating around all the time? Now, this, the other thing is once we introduce CBDC, central bank digital currency, like a digital dollar, digital euro, there might be different effects also on monetary policy. Remember in cash, there's no interest on it. The interest cannot be negative. The interest cannot be positive. It's just fixed at zero. Of course, in digital reserves and checking accounts, the interest rate is there. But if you can, if the central bank can pay interest or even charge interest if the interest rate is negative uh, on digital currencies, it issues on its own to its citizens then it has implications for monetary policy. It can be more powerful in the way to conduct monetary policy. And because we have all these different forms of money, we will have much more competition across this money. So that's closer to the libertarian school of thinking, like the FA Hayek's thinking, where you have different currencies competing with each other. And it also means if there's more competition, it's harder to impose some inflation on the citizens and have some inflation tax imposed. Now, uh, and there will be competition internationally. So you will be much more easy to use, you know, the Euro or the Remimbi. And of course, you know already, I know I have some Chinese friends in the US when they go to China's restaurant, they pay with WeChat Pay or Alipay. And they pay their, uh, even though they consume the food in the United States, they pay with the Remimbis, digital Remimbis uh, uh, this way. So there are big changes coming up and the competition will be much more forceful. And there's a, a danger of a loss of monetary sovereignty. So what happened is that money, of course, initially was more created by bankers and the private scene, and then it was moved over to the government, became more the public element. So the unit of account role where, you know, how we think and what currency we think, that's actually governed by the central banks, so by the government. And there might be some, certain governments might not be able to sustain the currency. They will be overrun by some foreign digital currency, what's called digital dollarization. We have already dollarization out there. So if you're a small middle uh, cent a Central American country, you will be run over by the dollar and suddenly everything will be conducted in dollars and you have no power of monetary policy anymore. Here, it will be the case that the digital dollar might run over, the digital euro, digital remimbi might uh, uh, conquer your country. Or it might be uh, Facebook or Meta now with its digital Libra or DM, it now it stopped this movement, but there was a threat, the monetary sovereignty will go away. And the question is how will a country react in order to defend its currency, to make sure the currency is still relevant as we move all much more to a virtual and digital world. One is to say, okay, one way to defense, I compete with that by having my own central bank digital currency, that's CBDC, or I give up and essentially stay with private money as all. We have a lot of stable coins, but I do it with bank regulation, with deposit insurance, lender of last resort policies, and that's an alternative way how to deal with that. Now, a new concept which can come around. So what is a currency area? If you think about currency areas at the moment, they are simply countries. Each country has its own currency. Sometimes you have a currency union like the European uh, Euro area, and that's a currency area. So it's always given by boundaries and borders of countries that determines what the currency area is. Now, in the future, it will be much more that people will use many currencies in their wallets and they'll swap back and forth between the currencies, foreign and domestic ones, private and public ones with different units of accounts. But what will govern very much what a currency area is or digital currency areas will be social networks. If you all hang out in the same 
uh, Facebook or Metaspace, you might use the Facebook uh, currency for that transactions, which are concerning uh, that transactions. So the digital currency is a new concept. It's a different concept, which depends much more on you know, social networks or platforms you are associated with some supply chains you're associated with. And that will actually determine uh, your token or the currency you live on. And what keeps essentially the country still in the game is because privacy regulation will be at the national or regional level. So there will be privacy regulation based on the US, there will be a different privacy regulation in Europe or in Asia. And that actually because a lot of payments is associated with privacy issues, it is actually the case that there will be more national currency still, but it's primarily driven by privacy regulation issues. If there were no privacy regulation issues, we would probably have different currencies to deal with depending on which digital platforms we live on in the future and we probably live on several digital platforms and swap currencies back and forth all the time so how do i see the international monetary architecture uh, the different continents go in different directions so i should have put up india and other asian countries as well but in the us there's some hesitancy to go for the central bank digital currency so what the us will do is the US will focus much more on dollar stable coins. So the private sector will actually issue tokens, some stable coins, and link it to the dollar. So this way there will be a network of private stable coins linked to the dollar, and that will help to maintain the dominance of the US dollar. And the regulation, and we have seen there was a presidential working group last year, will be about how to regulate the stable coins to make sure there's still some stability, there's no financial instability risk and so forth. Europe is going a different way. Europe is going more for the central bank digital currency. It's called the digital euro. And they're very concerned about maintaining the uniformity of the euro within the euro area. So that's why they're going for the digital euro much more so. China went for the digital renminbi, or yuan, or digital yuan, but essentially their way to expand their influence in terms of currency would be much more with the private companies Alipay and WeChat Pay. So Alipay and WeChat Pay are these huge payment platforms by Ant Financial, which belongs to Alibaba, and WeChat Pay belongs to Tencent. These are the two giant uh, digital uh, firms, tech firms in China. And they can spread, as I mentioned, they can spread across the globe uh, very easily to other countries, uh, their uh, payment system, and with it, the Remimbi as well. And this way, China will spread. And then, of course, other Asian countries, they are essentially influenced by them, uh, by this um, spreading of uh, Chinese, the Chinese uh, currencies. So that's essentially uh, what I wanted to give a, a brief overview. There are many other issues, how to design these central bank digital currencies, what are the trade-offs? There might be more runs on banks, how to avoid that there would be more runs on banks because you have a new safe harbor you can run into. Uh, the, it might crowd out the cheap bank funding banks have. And essentially, there's also, if the central bank is issuing its own money, much more in digital form, it might have way more fund inflow, so it has to invest it. So it gets a much bigger political footprint. Do we want that? That's also an issue we have to keep in mind. And how, you know, should there be a limit how big the accounts you can have with the digital euro or the digital dollar, or should they be unlimited? So there are a lot of issues we can discuss, and now let me stop here and open up for the Q&A. And again, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to outline my thoughts uh, in front of you. And I'm looking forward to your questions and feedback. Ball back to you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Brittermeyer. Uh, and uh, I've got a couple of questions here to begin. Uh, first from uh, Patrick Sparrow, who happens to be the librarian of the APS. Uh, what is your view on the long-term durability of collectible NFTs? Are these just a fad or do you see digital artwork NFTs as a legitimate form of collecting in the same way people have historically collected rare books and artwork? That's a very, I mean, it's very hard to answer because it's about how to speculate on NFTs and I don't, I can't give you a good investment advice there, but you know, the question is the same one. If you get the real Mona Lisa or you get the fake Mona Lisa and probably you cannot figure out which one is the real one, one is the fake one. If you 
put the painting in your room and you have the fake one, you probably will enjoy it as much as the real one, but the real one is worth much more. Now the question is, if your painting is attached to an NFT, how much more do you value it? And how much does the market or society value it? So I can see that society might value it down the road, but it's, you know, if you really just enjoy a painting, you don't get much more out of it by having it registered on a blockchain. It's, you know, it's a highly speculative thing. So we don't know. It's, it's how society will think about this down the road and will attach some value to it and we can pass it on to others. And if society says, no, that's all nonsense, then your investment is gone. And if it explodes and people really attach a huge amount of value to it, then you have made a good investment. But it's highly speculative at this stage. Oh, so here's a question from David Maxey, who has uh, been, been published, I think, repeatedly by the APS Press uh, as a local lawyer. Can you imagine a perfect storm that will bring the whole cyber currency structure down? Yes, we better imagine it. I mean, there might be some uh, cyber attack uh, coming up. And uh, so essentially when what we saw when there's real serious war, cash is still king. Okay, it's very hard to, to replace cash because you don't, you're not subject to these huge cyber attacks. And you know, if you look at Bitcoin, for example, there are just probably a very few miners in Kazakhstan. There were a lot in China, China kicked them out. They're now in Kazakhstan. You probably, you know, with you come with an army with some tanks and wipe them out. I mean, there will be big disruptions in the cyberspace and also in this uh, cryptocurrencies. And so you can't rule this out. And that, that makes it the whole scenario more risky uh, as well. So that's, I wouldn't rule it out, but it, I would attach a huge probability, probably not, but I would attach some probability to that. Okay, with that, thanks very, very much, Professor Brunermeyer.